Hello everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Alice Tay Lecture on Law and Human Rights. I'm Dr. Melissa Lovell, Convener and Research Fellow of the Herbert and Balmay Freilich Project for the Study of Bigotry at the ANU. I want to thank you for joining us. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we are meeting. I also pay my respects to any elders who may be with us today. For over 20 years, the Freilich Project for the Study of Bigotry has sought to contribute to our understanding of the history, causes and impacts of bigotry. As an interdisciplinary research centre, we draw on a broad range of knowledge and expertise from within the university sector and beyond. We seek to disseminate research and evidence-based approaches to supporting social inclusion and diversity. We also aim to connect people to high quality research on bigotry, prejudice and discrimination. The annual Alice Tay Lecture Series is one way we seek to achieve these goals. Professor Alice Tay was a much admired member of the Freilich Project's advisory board, as well as president of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission. We first held the Alice Tay Lecture in her memory in 2005, to honour her life's work in human rights and law. The lecture series continues to explore this topic, with each invited lecturer contributing their unique expertise and strengths to a consideration of the role of human rights in the law in promoting a more socially just future. This year, the Alice Tay Lecture is being held in conjunction with the ANU College of Arts and Social Sciences Reconciliation Lecture. The Reconciliation Lecture centres Indigenous scholars and their research as part of the College's Reconciliation Action Plan. We're incredibly pleased to welcome distinguished professor Eileen Walton Robertson as our lecturer this year. I'll now hand over to Professor Ray Francis, Dean of the College of Arts and Social Sciences, to introduce Professor Morton Robertson. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and I, of course, would also like to acknowledge and celebrate the traditional owners of all the lands and airways over which we are um, operating this evening. And I also pay my respects to the elders past and present and especially welcome all the First Nations people who are joining us um, for this exciting event. We are very excited to welcome distinguished Professor Eileen Morton Robinson today. Professor Morton Robinson has recently been recognised as the 2021 ANU Indigenous Alumna of the Year for her contributions as an Australian academic, an Indigenous feminist, an author and an activist for Indigenous rights. Eileen is a Gonpur woman from Kwandamuka country in Queensland and has had a distinguished career including being the first Aboriginal person to be appointed to a mainstream lecturing position in women's studies in Australia. She is Australia's first Indigenous Distinguished Professor, and recently she became the first Indigenous scholar outside the USA to be elected as an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research, including her monographs, Talking Up to the White Woman, Indigenous Women and Feminism, and The White Possessive, Property, Power and Indigenous Sovereignty have made critical interventions into feminist and legal scholarship. And she's really something of a legend um, amongst um, university students in particular for her pathbreaking and courageous work. Her tireless commitment to reform has inspired a generation of Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars to challenge racism in the academy and beyond. Today, Professor Morton Robinson will be speaking on the topic, The Paradox of Race in Australian Legal Thought, Making the Invisible Visible. Um, she's going to be speaking for a bit over 30 minutes and has kindly agreed to answer a number of questions. And um, so if you have a question, you can put it into the Q&A function at the end of the lecture. So everyone, please join me in welcoming distinguished Professor Eileen Morton Robinson. Thank you for the um, welcome and uh, I appreciate being invited to speak as part, as a, a speaker for this series. I'm speaking today from uh, Gubby Gubby country, my great 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 grandmother's country and I'd like to um, also acknowledge a use of the office of Professor Gary Thomas uh, at the University of Sunshine Coast which is where this is uh, where I beamed in from. Um, I would like to acknowledge also the sovereignties of Indigenous peoples throughout Australia and beyond 
Um, and I would like to um, dedicate this lecture to Charles, Professor Charles Mills, who passed away a couple of days ago. He uh, was a phenomenal black uh, philosopher who uh, shaped my thinking in quite a lot of ways. So to begin, in December 2019, Pauline Hanson moved a motion in the Senate stating it's okay to be white, noting people have a right to be proud of their culture, whether they be black, white or brindle. Pauline explained she was speaking against the, quote, deplorable rise of anti-white racism and attacks on Western civilization. The it's okay to be white motion sparked international interest and received public backlash because the slogan is aligned with far-right racist and extremist groups. The motion was narrowly defeated by three votes in the Senate and was supported by 23 votes from the Liberal Coalition members who were directed by the Attorney General's office to vote in favour. The Prime Minister stated it, was, stated it was regrettable that his senators backed the motion, while Attorney General Christian Porter took to Twitter stating, quote, the government's senators' actions in the Senate confirm that the government deplores racism of any kind, end of quote. However, Twitter, Twitter was not inundated by Porter and his fellow senators condemning Hansen's racism in 2017 when she called for a ban on full face coverings in public and mocked the Islamic faith by wearing a burger in the Senate. In June 2020, Hansen moved another motion in the Senate to exclude critical race theory from the national curriculum. She stated that, and I quote, it is from critical race theory that we get terms like systemic racism and white privilege, which radical leftists love to throw around so much. And unless we take a stand that values that make Australia the great nation, we'll continue to die the death of a thousand cuts. Critical race theory has no place in the curriculum of our nation. Our children deserve an education, not indoctrination, end of quote. The second motion was carried in the Senate, even though critical race theory is not on the national curriculum. This leads me to ask what logics are at play when fiction is accepted as the truth. Hanson's motions were cleverly crafted to make race invisible by assigning colour to culture. But in the Australian vernacular, black, white and brindle are not cultures. They reference skin tone within the visual register of race and are markers of exclusion. Hanson, by expressing the rise of anti-white racism and attacks to Western civilisation together in the same sentence, is signifying an intimate relationship between the two. The white race is synonymous with Western civilization. Thus, we can deduce it is the black and brindle races who are attacking Western civilization and practicing anti-white racism. She imputes, imputes this violence in two ways. First, by using the metaphor death by a thousand cuts to describe the incremental loss of white Australian values. And in doing so, she invokes the Chinese as an existential threat to the nation. Historically, death by a thousand cuts was a form of prolonged execution that became mythologised by, by the West to cement a particular image of China as being degenerate and evil. Second, Hansen infers that anti-white racism is the product of critical race theory, which apparently throws about terms like white race privilege and systemic racism. She infers these ideas are being used to indoctrinate children as white oppressors and invaders through the national curriculum. Her assault on critical race theory mimics the antiques and condemnation by right-wing politicians in the USA of African-American, Latino and Asian legal scholars whose work analyzes and explores how race is central to the development of law and policy. Critical race theory originated in legal scholarship led by these quote, black and brindle academics. Critical race theory is not part of the national school curriculum, nor is it taught as part of the core curriculum in Australian law faculties. This fact seems to have been overlooked by everyone. And interestingly, the media did not report on any calls of proof by independent Labor senators who voted against the motion. The success of the motion in the Senate implies there is a real threat to making white race racial supremacy visible through teaching about its role 
in the colonisation of this country. As a concept, race has a history that predates the formation of Australia as a federation and the embedding of race powers in the Australian constitution. Australian governments and the judiciary have worked in tandem or independently to operationalise race in legal thought. Race was salient in the first piece of legislation passed by the new federal government as the Immigration Restriction Act, which was assented on the 23rd of December, 1901. In the past decade, race has surfaced in public discourse concerning constitutional reform to limit the capacity of Parliament's race powers to discriminate ne negatively against Indigenous people and people of colour. This paper situates past and present key legal definitions of race to consider evolving meanings in historical and contemporary contexts. It argues that while race is understood by science as a biological fiction, the law continues to import biology to give meaning to its effect, and in doing so, creates a paradox that is inherently racist. As a concept, race is usually identified as emerging in the 17th century. In his paper commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Race Discrimination Act, Justice French states that the idea of race has its origins in the work of Francois Bernet, a French phys physician who categorised races according to physical and biological attributes. His schema influenced the development of scientific racism in the 18th century. But medieval study scholars have traced the invention of race to an earlier period. During the Middle Ages, European Christian rulers were the defenders of the faith. And although their language and homelands were different, Christianity provided the faithful with a sense of unity and cohesion. The world was conceived as being clearly divided into Christians and all others, including dissenting Christians. In researching the European Middle Ages, Professor Geraldine Heng argues that, quote, one of the spectacular cultural creations of the medieval period, the Mapamundi, or world map, hits its stride in the 13th century as a medium that visually unfolds an imagined universe of space-time, which pictures the world in extraordinary ways that reflect on and concretize locations of race. The opulent Western European Hereford map identifies places outside of Europe as the habitat of human groups made distinct by the attribution of traits to them that are notable by virtue of their difference from normativity in the Latin West. Race is what the rest of the world has. These world maps were the means by which European culture comprehended and conceptualised other races, especially Ethiopians, Jews, Muslims and Mongols. In England in the 12th century, race had a physicality from as early as 1144. Jewish people were marked by race. Caricatures of Jewish phenotypes and biomarkers survive in English manuscripts and visual art. Jews were important to English commerce, but they were monitored by the Crown's administrative apparatuses. Statutes, ordins, ordinances and decrees ruled their lives and special registers were set up to investigate their economic activity. He argues that, quote, in England then, the Jewish badge, expulsion order, legislative enforcements, surveillance and segregation, ritualised iterations of homicidal fables and the legal execution of Jews are constitutive acts in the consolidation of a community of Christian English, otherwise internally fragmented and ranged along numerous divides against a minority population that has on these historical occasions and through these institutions and practices entered into race. In England, the idea of race was operating in law, therefore prior to the 17th century. As I have argued elsewhere, in Britain, race and law share an ontological intimacy. 
a regime of racialized power was already operating in the 16th century when God's representative was sitting on the throne in England. The divine right of kings as a political doctrine gave absolute power to the monarch to make laws and rule. As the earthly representative of God, the king's authority was supported by the church and religion was integral to the racial formation of England. In religious art of the Middle Ages, especially between 1066 AD and 1485 AD, black is the colour used to represent the devil as the embodiment of evil. By the 16th century, blackness was defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as being deeply stained with dirt, foul, iniquitous, atrocious, horrible, wicked, indicating disgrace, censure, liability or punishment. In this English definition of blackness, the attribute relationship between badness, disgrace, censure, liability and punishment imports an obligation to negate and penalise blackness. The innate badness attributed to blackness served the English slave trade well in West Africa and the Congo, which operated between the 16th and 19th centuries. Britain's economy flourished particularly the Royal African Company, owned by King Charles II, the formal head of the Protestant Church, and his brother, James, the Duke of York. In 1663, Charles issued a charter giving royal approval to the slave trade. Between 1672 and 1730, the Royal African Company had transported approximately 100,000 African slaves across the Atlantic. Africans were identified as the embodiment of blackness and assigned the racial attributes ascribed to it. This is how race demarcated human differences and selectively essentialized attributes as absolute and fundamental in order to distribute and re retain regimes of power. The African slave trade cemented the assigning of blackness as the essential biomarker of race. In doing so, it rendered invisible the British as a white race whose superiority lay in the God-given right to rule others, steal their lands and enslave black bodies, turning them into commodities for profit. Race was pivotal to the British economy prior to Captain James Cook departing England to embark on his epic voyage, voyages of discovery in the latter part of the 18th century. Like the English, the Dutch were involved in the transatlantic slave trade and maritime records from the early 17th century reveal the racialization of Aboriginal people at work in voyages to Australia. Willem Janssen in 1606 landed on the west coast of Cape York Peninsula, describing Aboriginal people as, and I quote, savage, cruel, black barbarians who slew some of our sailors, end of quote. The Dutch East India Company were heavily invested in slavery and sponsored another voyage to the Gulf of Carpentaria, led by Jan Carter in 1623. He described the country as, people as the most arid and barren region that could be found anywhere on earth. The inhabitants too are most wretched and poorest creatures that I've ever seen in my age or time, end of quote. So by the time that Cook discovered Australia, blackness as the biomarker of race was embedded in the English lexicon as an epistemological presupposition of racial knowledge. In, in researching Cook's journals, we find a white man who colour coded the bodies he was viewing from the deck of his ship. On the 22nd of April in 1770, on the east coast of Australia, his first sightings of natives was as such, quote, and were so near the shore as to distinguish several people from the sea beach. They appeared to be of a very dark or black colour, but whether this was the real colour of their skins or the clothes they have on, I know not, end quote. As he travelled further up the coast to the tip of Cape York Peninsula, he observed and then wrote in his journals that the natives ranged in colour from dark chocolate to soot, which is black. Colour-coded as such, 
Aborigines were assigned a place in the British racial order as inferior, uncivilised and insufficiently ruled by reason. There could be no treaty with these natives. Race was the means by which Aborigines were known and treated. Michael Meadows explains in the Colonist Diaries they referred to Aborigines as, quote, the lowest in rank among the human race, as the most miserable of the human form under heaven, more like monkeys than warriors, or as altogether a most stupid, insensible set of beings, end of quote. These racist descriptions provide insights about racial knowledge in the late 18th century, by which a hierarchy of humans had been established, assigning white races to the top and black races to the bottom, representing the lowest stage of human society and barbarity. Towards the end of the 18th century, the emergence of physical and biological science had developed ideas about race as being innate. Racial knowledge was furnished to the public via media in Australia. In March 1803, the first newspaper, The Gazette, was established in Sydney. Meadows argues that the spread of journalism and the press system in Australia was, quote, highly varied across the colony because of differences in governance and geography, end of quote. Tasmania was the next colony to set up a newspaper, followed by Perth in 1826 and Brisbane in 1846. These newspapers used racial reference, reference Aborigines, Blacks and Natives in their reporting from the 18th century right into the 21st century. Meadows argues early Queensland newspapers such as the Morton Bay Courier included a regular section simply entitled The Blacks, which relayed to its readers the latest news of conflict as settlers moved beyond the new township of Brisbane. Meadows further states that other studies of colonial press reveal a similar experience to that of early Queensland, with Aboriginal people being variously framed as a problem, voiceless and without a claim on citizenship, end of quote. Darwin's theory of natural selection informed ideas about race. Survival of the fittest depended on the non-random transfer of biological traits that worked to maximise the gene pool within a given population. Through natural selection, weaker species die out. Physical anthropology in Australia was hard at work establishing race as an area of study and continued to do so until the 1950s. Representations of Aboriginal people in newspapers and magazines around the end of the 19th century drew on Darwinian theory and anthropological studies. Michael Meadows further argues, and I quote, in 1881, the age referred to the Aborigines as a bygone people. In 1888, it cited the law of nature that where two races whose stages of progress were different came into contact, the inferior was doomed to wither and die. By the 1890s, there was rejoicing in the media that the passing of Aborigines would make a contribution to the solution of the race problem in Australia, end of quote. Race informed and shaped the Australian vernacular and it was imported into Australian law. The first proclamation made by Governor Macquarie in 1816 was to declare Aborigines were subject to white law, but contra any contraventions would lose that protection. From 1816 to 1900, approximately 148 pieces of legislation and amendments affected the lives of Aborigines in the colonies. There is a consistent pattern across the colonies during these 84 years as to what needed to be in law for those racially assigned as the Aboriginal race, Aboriginal natives, black natives and half-castes. A large body of legislation was designed to regulate, manage and control Aboriginal lives. Legislation determined the terms and conditions of Aboriginal employment and servitude, the status of Aboriginal prisoners, their imprisonment, capital punishment and whipping, the reliability of unsworn Aboriginal testimony in court, 
and the ca capacity to be competent witnesses. There was increased police powers to attend to vagrancy for degenerate whites and others who had no fixed address and were found to be associating with Aborigines. Aborigines were ineligible to vote and run for elections, but were granted the right to fish and hunt game for personal consumption. Aboriginal children and young adults were removed to industrial and reformatory schools. Aboriginals were ineligible to join the military and receive a pension, and it was illegal for them to partake of alcohol and opium. Crown land was allocated for the establishment of Aboriginal reserves under the control of white male protector. This discriminatory body of law was in place prior to the development of the Australian Constitution and the passing of the 1901 Immigration Restriction Act. The law assigned race to those who were not members of the white race. Thus, the concept of race imports for Aborigines differentiation and hypervisibility. This visible difference is separated from and in contrast to the invisible, omnipresent white race within law that defines itself by what it is not. In 19th century Australia, other pieces of legislation assigned race to other non-white races to restrict, control and regulate their movements. Legal scholar Sorda states that these included, and I quote, the Indian, Afghan, Syrian hawkers, the Chinese miners, laundrymen, market gardeners and furnished manufacturers, the Japanese settlers and Kanaka plantation labourers of Queensland and the various coloured races employed in the pearling fisheries, end quote. The New South Wales Chinese Restriction and Regulation Act of 1888 used the concept race as such, I and quote directly from the Act, in applying and extending provisions of the said Act, as aforesaid, they shall be read immediately after the word Chinese, where it occurs, occurs in the what said Act, the words or person of any coloured race inhabiting the content of Asia or the content of Africa or any island adjacent to either continent or any island in the Pacific Ocean or in the Indian Ocean, or the words or persons of any coloured races, end of quote. This Act was amended in 1896 and became the Coloured Races Restriction Regulation Act. Similar acts restricting and controlling the coloured races existed in other colonies, such as the South Australian Coloured Immigration Restriction Act of 1896. No literal definition is provided for the concept of act, or concept of race within either act and the amendments. Instead, meaning is imputed from the vernacular. Physiological traits that are not possessed by white people are what identifies and constitutes race. In this legislation, race is assigned to the non-native coloured populations, but the invisible white race is exempt from its ambit. In this way, the law enables the white race to be invisible and to vacate race. The discursive term is repeated in the legislative framework of Australia's constitution drafted between 1891 and 1898. The constitution enabled colonies to become states. It set out the role of the Commonwealth in the Australian Parliament, the sharing of power to make laws between state and federal parliaments, and the role of executive government and the establishment of the High Court. Three sections specifically referred to race and all were designed for control, regulation and exclusion. Section 25 affirmed pre-existing legislation in place in the colonies, which excluded voting by Aborigines and any coloured races from Asia and Africa or any island adjacent to either continent or any island in the Pacific Ocean or in the Indian Ocean. Queensland passed the Electoral Act of 1872, which was amended in 1874 and 1885. Section 526 allowed the Commonwealth to make special laws for people of any race but Aborigines, but not Aborigines. This section is consistent with the application of special laws to control the coloured populations in the colony of New South Wales through the Coloured Races Restriction Regulation Act of 1896 and in the colony of South Australia, which passed the Coloured Immigration Restriction Act of 1896, and in the same year, the colony of Victoria's 
Coloured Racious Restriction and Regulation Act of 1896. As noted earlier, approximately 148 pieces of discriminatory legislation were in place targeting Aborigines in the respective colonies by, the ninth, by 1900. Section 127 of the Constitution stated, quote, in reckoning the numbers of people of the Commonwealth or of the state or other part of the Commonwealth, Aboriginal natives shall not be counted, end of quote. Arconi argues that, and I quote, the rationale behind, behind that exclusion was not clear in the convention debates. Barton, in explaining the meaning of the provision, in the Melbourne session in 1898, made the enigmatic comments that Section 127 is related to determining the whole population where it would not be considered fair to include the Aborigines and that it only considered necessary to leave out of account the Aboriginal races. No further explanation was given by Barton or anyone else, end of quote. She explains that the removal of, removal of Aborigines from this section was more about calculations for representation purposes as the Commonwealth was given power to make laws in respect to the census and statistics under Section 5111 of the Constitution. The successful 1967 referendum amend, amended Section 51, 26, erasing the words, quote, other than the Aboriginal people in any state, and removed Section 127. The Commonwealth was empowered to use its new race powers to legislate on behalf of Aborigines. The race powers in the Australian Constitution are not there by accident or oversight. They were consciously put in place by the founding white fathers as a mechanism to ensure Australia remains a white nation. While Section 5226 now refers to the Commonwealth having the power to make laws on behalf of all races, there is no interpretive provision in the Constitution for the concept race. Barton, who was Australia's first Prime Minister and subsequently one of the first High Court judges, explained the function of the race powers are designed, and I quote, to deal with the affairs of such persons of other races, what are generally called inferior races, though I do not know with how much warrant sometimes, who may be in the Commonwealth at the time it is brought into existence or who may be under the laws of the Commonwealth regulating alien aliens coming into it, end of quote. Barton's proposition that the race powers were in place to deal with inferior races was evident in the first piece of legislation passed by the new federal parliament. The Immigration Restriction Act, number 79, 1901, only uses the concept race once in section nine with reference to the European race. And this legislation was designed so that any person who quote, was a British subject, either natural born or naturalised under the law of the kingdom, United Kingdom, was the preferred immigrant. In practice, this legislation enabled the white Australia policy, but there is no interpretive provision for race in the legislation. Preference is accorded to the invisible white race by the overt measures in place, such as the dictation tests in English, which were designed to exclude coloured races for whom English was a second language. The development of Australian citizenship has been intertwined with immigration since Federation. Prior to 1949, Australians could only hold the status of British subjects. The new Nationality and Australian Citizenship Act of 1948 did not use the word race in describing persons. Instead, it referred to them as citizens or subjects and by nationality. It appears the change was influenced by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of which Article 2 states, and I quote, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, colour, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political, jurisdictional or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent, trust, non-self-governing or any other limitation of sovereignty, end of quote. 
1945, Australia played a pivotal role in establishing the United Nations Charter, and former High Court Judge Dr Herb Ebert contributed to drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the 10th of December, which 1948 came into being. Stratton argues that the Australian definition of white was expanded to include a variety of Eastern and Central European refugees by 1949. And the Australian use and the <coughs> excuse me, the Australian usage of white uh, covered all the people in Europe who were quite technically thought of as white. The geographical definition of European had come to equate with the racial racial classification of white. The integration of various Europeans into a white Australian identity coalesced around Australian norms was enabled by a worldview that defined Aboriginal people up until the 1960s as non-citizens. The white Australia policy, despite being revoked in 1973, continued in practice for many years. And and I quote Cheryl Harrison saying, the courts played an active role in enforcing this right to exclude in that the sense that the courts protect us, what protected whiteness as they did with any other form of property. Despite Australia's commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Aboriginal people were not deemed to be eligible as humans to these rights and their status in law reflected this discrimination. Legal scholar John McCorkadale, an amazing, amazing scholar, everybody should read his PhD, argues with reference to the racial signification and assignment of race to Aborigines in law that, and I quote, at given top stages, an Aboriginal could be a member of a people, a race, or one of the natives or native inhabitants of Australia. Further, Commonwealth regulations made under the National Services Act of 1951 fully described Aboriginality in terms of admixture of blood, and the states and territories defined Aborigines mainly by blood. For example, he notes, between 1874 and 1936, Western Australia distinguished between Aboriginal natives of the whole blood and the half blood, sometimes by reference to the native race, in 1874 and legislation in 1883, sometimes by reference to Aboriginal race in 1874 and 1943, and to the Aboriginal race of Western Australia in 1897, to Aboriginal Native of Australia in 1886, 1893, 1899, 1907, 1934, until it replaced Aborigine with Native in the Aborigines Act Amendment Act of 1936. The Act created also another status, that of quadroon being one fourth of the original full blood, but quadroons were not subject to the legislation if they were under 21 and did not associate with or live substantially with after the manner of natives. But even then, such a person and no one over 21, but he could be classified as a native by order of a magistrate. In 1954, the Native Administration Act amended, provided that a native could be deemed to be no longer a native for the purposes of the Act if he had served as a member of the armed forces outside the Commonwealth or for at least six months within it and was entitled to an honourable discharge. The classification of quadroon was repealed in 1960. Accordingly, the definition of native was confined to full bloods and greater than one fourth of the original full blood until the blood test was replaced by the descent identification test in 1972. Even the latter test of identification and acceptance as Aboriginal by the local community was omitted from another act in the same year. Australian law has predominantly assigned race to non-white people. Legislative and judicial definitions of race have remained invisible or at best ambig ambiguous. For example, the Race Discrimination Act of 1975 does not define race, but does identify an Aboriginal person, Aboriginal as a person descended from an Indigenous inhabitant of Australia. This act is primarily concerned with applying the principle of formal equality before the law to unlawful discrimination marked 
by race, colour, descent or national or ethnic origin. A year after the Racial Discrimination Act was ascended, the historical landmark Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act 1976 defined an Aboriginal as meaning a person who is a member of the Aboriginal race of Australia. Judicial considerations of race did not occur until the Tasmanian Dam case in 1983. In that case, Justices Brennan and Dean relied on its meaning in the Australian vernacular, defining race as, and I quote, the popular or common meaning of race as observable human differences derived from common ancestry, end of quote. Brendan noted, noted there were no discrete races and then contradicted this by arguing that, quote, membership of a race imports a biological history or origin which is common to other members of the race. Actual proof of descent from ancestors who were acknowledged members of the race or actual proof of descent from ancestors, none of whom were members of the race, is admissible to prove or contradict, as the case may be, an assertion of membership of the race. Genetic heritage is fixed at birth. The historic, religious, religious spiritual and cultural heritage are acquired and susceptible to influences for which a law may provide, end of quote. Justice Dean found, and I quote, plainly, the words people of any race in section 5126 have a wide and non-technical meaning. The phrase is, in my view, the opposite to refer to all Australian Aborigines collectively. The phrase is also to refer to any identifiable racial subgroup among Australian Aboriginals. By Australian Aboriginals, I mean in accordance with what I understand to be the conventional meaning of that term, a person of Aboriginal descent, albeit mixed, who identifies himself as such and who is recognised by the Aboriginal community as an Aboriginal. Justices Brennan and Dean import biology into their definitions as the primary determining feature of race. Biological descent is the means by which race is transferred, and this was reiterated by Justice Brennan in Marbo versus Queensland, number two, 1992. What is disturbing about these considerations is High Court judges imputing common and popular ideas about race in Australia instead of examining precedents in racial jurisprudence from other countries. Brennan and Dean externalise race in their thinking about Aborigines. Their decisions reflect a race blindness to whiteness. The existence of discrete biological races has been challenged and substantiated by scientists since the 1960s. There are as many physiological differences within human populations who have been socially constructed as races as there are between them. The completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003 found the idea that humans are not composed of five distinct races, as no trademark genetic features characteristics of one race are not present in others. Despite the recognition that races as discrete physiological entities do not exist, this judicial definition imports biology which is historically consistent with the common idea of race in Australian law. In defining and assigning race in this way, the law allowed Aborigines a place within the Australian racial order and the invisibility of the white race remains undetected and protected. After the judicial consideration of race in the Tasmanian Dam case, the Commonwealth Government continued to use the meaning of an Aboriginal person in legislation as being a member of the Aboriginal race. Some examples include the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Heritage Act of 1984, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Studies Act 1989, the Native Title Act 1993, the Indigenous Education Target Assistance Act of 2000, the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Act of 2005, and the Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs and other legislation amendment, Northern Territory National Emergency Emergency Response and Other Measures Act 2007, to name a few. The interpretive provisions of other pieces of legislation define an Aborigine as an Aboriginal person, which is also problematic because unless specified elsewhere in the legislation, 
race will be redeployed as the default definer of its composition. The most recent judicial consideration of the relationship between race and Aboriginality manifested in Love versus the Commonwealth of Australia, when two Aboriginal plaintiffs, Love and Toms, sought special leave from the High Court to prevent their deportation on the grounds they were not aliens as defined under the Constitution. The High Court majority determined in the plaintiff's favour that an Aboriginal non-citizen could not be an alien. Torres Strait Islander legal scholar Professor Asmi Wood argues, and I quote, the founders designed the constitution specifically to prevent the abuse of power by one limb of government unchecked by any other through the structurally embedded doctrine of the separation of powers. Clearly, the federal protection was aimed only at white people as Aboriginal natives were not a group that the founders and hence the constitution as enacted sought to protect. It is settled generally that executive power is bound or limited, but this limitation applies largely for non-Indigenous peoples only. The founders discussed race in the context of alien races, making it difficult for the High Court to completely disentangle the terms alien and race. Further, the founders explicitly excluded an equality clause from the Constitution. The absence of a positive constitutional race protection provision was perhaps an important factor in the court's ultimate decision, difficulty in reaching a unified decision in law, end of quote. The difficulty in disentangling alien from race under the constitution was perhaps because these concepts were designed to exclude coloured people and did not explicitly apply to Aboriginal people until after 1967. Alien and race are biomarkers of exclusion. The biomarker of inclusion is the invisible white race. The benefactor of the white founding fathers possessive investments in constructing the nation as a white possession in law. The race powers exist to manage the inferior non-white races. Lawyers George Williams and Daniel Reynolds argue that they are, quote, not aware of any other constitution in the world that still provides a license to its national parliament to discriminate negatively on the basis of race, end of quote. And the Australian parliament has used this license on three occasions to suspend the Racial Discrimination Act, to enact its racism against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. First, through the High Marsh Island Bridge Act of 1997, by which Aboriginal women's cultural heritage rights were removed. Second, through the Native Title Amendment Act of 1998, which reduced Aboriginal Native Title rights. And third, by the Northern Territory National Emergency Act of 2007, by which Indigenous human rights protections were severely diminished. This racism occurred in the context of the Howard-led government's glorification of World War I as the defining moment of Australia's white nationalism and far-right race politics of Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party. Historically, race is invoked by and exists, coexists with a range of political agendas, and the law has played its part in cementing it into the structure of Australian society. In conclusion, the law has created a paradox. It has constructed race as a legal fiction by drawing on common and popular ideas of race, mobilising biological descent as the priming determinant of its composition. The law has not applied nor defined a race through the principle of formal equality. Race does not make us all equal before the law. And in this sense, the legal production of race is inherently racist. If formal equality was applied, then the white race would be visible and included within the legal fiction of race. Although the functions of race in Australia have changed over time, the law has not departed from the idea that race is a natural and organic, organic part of being a non-white human being. Governments and the judiciary work within a race-blind framework that does not see whiteness as a racial category. 
Instead, the rules of law are understood as race neutral. Whiteness is the racial norm in Australian law, as the peoples who are perceived to approximate blackness are the ones who are identified as racially different. Race sets the terms of social inclusion and cohesion. It is the ghost that haunts the political and legal domains in which claims for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice have been inadequately addressed to shed the legacy of our dispossession. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, um, Eileen, for that wonderful um, journey um, through history as well as the law. Um, as a historian, I especially um, appreciated um, the historical depth that you put to your um, analysis and um, a compelling analysis it is. Um, we have um, a few minutes for questions, but I wanted to use my privilege as the um, person in the, with the microphone to just ask you to comment. Um, I know that you're concerned about the past and the present um, of the status of um, race in Australia, um, but I also know that you're very concerned about the future. Um, can you tell us what you would like to see change about the current way in which race um, is enshrined in the Australian legal system? A small question. A small question that's actually been adequately answered, not by myself, but by Megan Davis and uh, also George Williams in their pieces where they are recommending that we need to change the constitution to be more explicit about um, positive discrimination uh, for Aboriginal people. Uh, and all people of colour. But I do think that, you know, if, if, uh, if we are to imagine that the white race is actually visible within law, what does that do to legislation? What does that do to the law in this country? Mm. That, that, for me, would be um, placing race uh, in the law in relation to formal equality. Mm. Yeah. Right? If we make white, the white race visible, in everything, that, yeah. that race isn't just reserved for Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander people and the coloured folk. Mm. What would that do to the law? What does it, that, would, that would actually reveal how white supremacy operates in this country and is privileged. Mm. You know, because, it, because the white race is hidden and, it, and it's in one sense evacuates race through the very way in which the law is structured. And that is really something that is, to that is peculiar to Australia. Okay, yeah. so, um, so I'm, I, you know, as for the future, I mean, all we can do, all, all that we can do is expose the fact that this is what is actually happening. You know, today what I, I wanted to do was to inform people about the, a history of race in this country, in law, and the way in which it, it, it has uh, remained undefined but applied to. Yeah. Right? Certain groups of people. Um, and by uh, discriminating against certain groups of people, you are privileging others. Mm. Um, and I, I uh, think that... You know, when we talk, you know, Pauline Hanson's uh, pushback against critical race theory is really to stymie um, studies of race in Australian law, which we actually need a lot more of. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that the work that you're doing is, is incredibly important in terms of exposing um, that assumption that, you know, so many people take for granted. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are other questions. Um, there's lots of very positive comments um, in the Q&A, um, but I'm not seeing any, any pressing questions. Um, oh, they yeah. answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so, um, so we've got a comment here that's another one positive. Um, very grateful that you are speaking to us, um, Professor. You've drawn our attention to court's lazy evocation of common sense instead of doing the hard work of looking honestly at race and defining it properly. Could you speak a little about the discomfort for colonizer settlers generated by the reality of first people's identity and status in your piece on Yorta Yorta? Yeah, 
Oh, God, I wrote that so long ago. Um, well, I think, okay, let, let, me, let me kind of, I guess, respond to it from the point of view that Yorta Yorta really, um, like race is totally functioning within Yorta Yorta, yep, and whiteness. And the implications, I guess, of Yorta Yorta then, because race and whiteness was deployed in particular ways, really has affected every Indigenous native title claim in this country, right? And it, uh, I have a brilliant uh, young uh, legal scholar who's doing this work, so I think hopefully she'll be able to answer the question better than me. But I do actually think that we, we have to basically start to teach in universities about race and law. You know, like we can't, um, ex you know, I keep going on about this, but we can't expect, um, you know, people to understand things in, without providing the conceptual tools whereby they can understand. That doesn't mean to say that I'm saying, oh, like, you know, it's going to change uh, the world, but at least we have to try rather than fundamentally just going, no, that can't be done, when in actual fact we know why that can't be done. Race hides that as well. Um, I, um, yeah, I'm, anyway, I hope I've answered some of the questions. Yeah, and we have another one. Um, how could the constitution be amended to make white race visible? How might that affect the wording, for example, of section 5126? Well, it has to be more specific about what it means by races, doesn't it? Mm. You have to amend the constitution to be more specific about what you mean by races. Mm. Um, you know, instead of just leaving it as a vacuous comment and go, oh, but that applies to those little colour people, you know. So, and that is the problem. Like, I, 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 you know, from where I stand, race race has done this. You know, it's the way, it's the way whiteness has made itself invisible because it normalises itself uh, within the law and it dictates what the law is in relation to the other, yeah, in order to protect itself. And that should be exposed and and if how it would be written it could be written into the, the constitution right now i couldn't give you the you know examples but it is something that we need we need to think about that you know we can't the law can't at one level go uh there's formal equality before the law mm, but we're going to treat this group over here as raced and this one over here doesn't have any um and we'll make legislation on this one over here but we'll just and do everything for this one over here. Uh, you know, the, and that's what I mean. It's like the law itself. It's so contradictory um, a, a, around the way in which it uh, deploys race um, and the ramifications of it for those of us who are coloured. Yeah. We're just about out of time, but I'm just going to read you out a wonderful um, comment that sums up I think what um, other people have been saying. Thank you so much, distinguished Professor Morton Robinson. You have identified a core change to mark and make visible whiteness as a racial category in law. The rest will follow. The point made that it is undefined yet applied is pivotal to this understanding. Eternally grateful for your immense contributions here and elsewhere. Um, I couldn't have said that better, so I'm very grateful and happy to endorse that. Um, and I'd also, um, you know, like to thank you again for giving us your time. I know how busy you are. And I'd also like to thank um, Velme Freilich, who is um, in the audience here tonight. Um, Velme, of course, is the, the donor, the major donor between the, behind the Herbert and Velme Foundation, which funds the project um, um, in its anti-bigotry campaign, basically, funding research that's hoping, helping to bring these things to light. So your lecture tonight has been an important part of that, I think. And um, there's been hundreds of people online and we have recorded the session. So those who missed it 
um, will be able to catch it as well. And we'll circulate that list widely and I'll ask people here to share that with people in your network. So thank you again, um, Eileen, and thank you everybody for your time this evening. Good night. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. Bye.